Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Thank you for coming today evening. And I will speak on the topic today of how our spirituality, our bhakti can improve our life. Recently, I was talking with a couple and the wife is practicing bhakti. The husband is favorable, but the husband say, tells his wife that actually you are simply praying instead of working. And God doesn't tell you to do that. He says, if you pray, but you don't work, how, what difference is it going to make? So, so he is saying that you are treating praying as a substitute for working. Now, that is often an understanding. Some people say you can't face life's problems, so you pray to God. Today I'll talk about this in three broad parts. That what bhakti actually means. And I'll talk about how our work produces its results. And then I'll talk about how bhakti, we can reshape our work and how our results are produced by that. So let's start with the first point of our, how our work produces our results. For, say for example, we may study. Uh, we have an exam, we study, and then we get the result. We have a project, we have a deadline. We work, we meet the deadline, and then we get a salary, we get a raise, we grow professionally. So normally, we see that our work is essential for producing results and this principle is acknowledged even in the tradition nahi suptasya simhasya pravishanti mukhe mrugaha it is said that a uh, simha a lion keep it here thank you even if the lion is very powerful and the lion has the capacity to eat other creatures but the lion cannot eat if it just lies down at one place if the lion just lies down with its mouth open it's not that a deer is going to come into its mouth so this idea that we have to work for producing our results producing the results that we want this is common sense however there is more to it we all see sometimes we work hard but we don't get the results that we deserve. How many of you had this experience? Anyone? Everyone. Everyone. <laughs> uh, those who don't raise their hands, either they are too shy or they are too inexperienced. <laughs> okay. A little experience of life shows us that that our efforts are not proportional necessary to the results that we get. Mm. But if we are honest with ourselves, we will see that sometimes we put in a little effort and we also get a lot of results. Sometimes we do a little work, but sometimes we get a lucky break and then things work out. So our work definitely matters, but our work is not all that matters. So the Bhagavad Gita explains that between our work and our result, there are multiple factors involved. To understand this, we can use a 3D or 4D principle. Duty plus destiny plus duration produces the desired result. You need anything? I don't need anything. I don't need anything. So, duty plus destiny plus duration produces the desired result. Say for example, a farmer wants a harvest. So, the farmer plows the land and sows the seeds, that is the duty. Then the rains have to come on time in the right quantity. Then the season has to change till the harvesting season comes and then the result comes up. Duty, destiny. Destiny is the rains coming, duration. 
and then the result suppose a couple is married and they want to have a child now they may unite that's their part but not every union leads to conception there's destiny involved over there and even if conception occurs after that there is gestation it's not that today they unite and tomorrow they have a child so this applies in every walk of life even in a field like sports the sports is very performance oriented say cr cricketers have to be athletic have to be fit have to be talented but many of the sports players when you cricketers have their own superstitions now say some players when they enter into the ground they'll always enter with the right foot first not the left foot if accidentally they break a left foot there would there a tv the left foot oh they go back and then they come back again put the right foot in so there was a australian cricketer a batsman he whenever he would go out to bat first he would go to the restrooms and close the lids of all the commodes and then go to bat bat and if ever he would get out early first he would come back to the restroom and if any of the lids would be open he would go and yell at all the other players why did you keep that open because of that i got out <laughs> and now uh, you say what is the commode lids position got to do with your bat getting out now now obviously we can say there is no correlation but actually it's not so obvious the what it means is that even play, players know that their performance matters but for their su success something more than their performance also matters say so batsman might be batting very well and might be leading the team to victory but if it rains at that time what can you do see in any field that we work in there are factors beyond our control that shape the results our efforts matter but factors beyond our efforts also matter so sometimes the factors beyond our effort the factors beyond our efforts sometimes destiny and duration might almost seem invisible to us say for example we eat food and we get energy might say there's duty and there's result desired result what is destiny over here but we realize what is destiny when somebody has a bad digestion so we eat and then we just feel heavy and bloated and we don't feel any energy at all actually the only time we think of our digestion is when it doesn't work <laughs> isn't it so now duty sometimes duration and the destiny might not be visible but that doesn't mean they're not there so how do our work produce its results it's not just by our work alone our work is one factor in a chain of events that leads to the result that's why krishna says in 247 in the bhagavad gita karmanne vadhikaraste ma phaleshu kadachana ma karma phal hetur bhur ma te sangostva karmani he says ma karma phal hetur bhur do not think that you are the cause of the results of your work now what does it mean you are not the cause here it means you are not the sole cause tatraivam sati kartaram atmanam kevalam tu yah pashyatya krita buddhitvan nasa pashyati durmati hi one of things that i am the sole doer krishna says in 1816 in the gita that person is an illusion so certainly we are the doers but we are not the sole doers so this is how our work produces results our we do our work that's our duty but there are factors beyond it which also shape the results so this was the first point i was going to make any questions about it till now okay so i'll go to the second point now what is bhakti and i'll talk about how bhakti shapes is the relationship between work and results now bhakti is sometimes thought of as 
so maybe praying chanting worshiping or some like bhakti is thought of as emotion devotion we talk about how when i come in front of the lord i feel some bhav that is bhakti now all these are aspects of bhakti the essence of bhakti is a is conscious continuous cultivation bhakti is cultivation of the heart so for, what does it mean that for all of us within our heart uh, there is there is a positive side there is a negative side we have certain virtues and we have certain vices we there's something within us sometimes prompts us to do something good sometimes it prompts us to do something bad so now this is a constant struggle that is going on within us and bhakti is the is the connection with god that makes us godly that means it nourishes our positive side the virtues within us they will nourish they will nourished and they will manifest more when we practice bhakti so in that sense bhakti is not just emotion bhakti is not just chanting bhakti is a process of self transformation it's a process of self transformation by which we become virtuous by which our inner strengths become stronger and by which our inner weaknesses become weaker the weaknesses might be anger negativity greed insecurity we can have many such things so these are all emotions which can overwhelm us and when they overwhelm us we cannot be at our best if you are filled with fear if you are filled with resentment if you are filled with anger no we cannot be at our best so something within us often stops us from doing our best and what bhakti does is that it removes the inner negative forces within us these inner negative forces are the result of impurity impurities within the heart they block our inner energy and when we become purified by the practice of bhakti then our inner energy starts flowing naturally smoothly powerfully so yes bhakti is about connecting with god bhakti is about practicing some some certain pra uh, practices but it is more than that it is about transforming ourselves empowering ourselves by strengthening our strengths and weakening our weaknesses so this is uh, what we are meant to do by, bhakti, by the practice of bhakti it's not just some ritual mm -hmm. now that is the second point what is bhakti mm -hmm. now the third point is how does bhakti shape our actions <coughs> so now as i said our work is important for the results to come but the work is not the sole cause of producing the results so when we are practicing bhakti some people might think of bhakti okay as simply i just pray and let god solve all my problems now bhakti is not about making god our personal servant i don't want to do the work oh god you do all the work for me it's not like that and even if we think of it like that it's not going to work like that <laughs> mm. but some people might think of it oh i, I don't want to work i just that's but that they're not actually practicing bhakti they're simply justifying their laziness in the name of bhakti the philosophy can be very easily used or misused to do what we want to do and suppose uh <clears throat> somebody says oh spiritual life tells us you should be detached mm. say a student is studying for the exam 
the students stop studying. And the parents say, why don't you study? He says, no, I'm detached. <laughs> you're not detached, you are irresponsible. <laughs> what is the difference? See, detachment is from the results, not from the work. After we do the work, we entrust the results to God. Whatever you want, you give me. So detachment is after we do the work. Irresponsibility is before we do the work. So sometimes people claim to be detached, but they are irresponsible. They're not doing their work only. And they say, I'm being spiritual. That's not spirituality. Spirituality is, as I said earlier, spiritual knowledge, what it does it? That why should we be detached from the results? Because we understand, I have done my part now, and I cannot do anything more than this. So I have done my part. Now let me move forward and do next thing. If the results are going to come, they are going to come. If they're not going to come, let me move on. So detachment comes from understanding the reality of how things work. Irresponsibility comes from not wanting to work at all. The two are different things. So now within this whole framework, when we practice bhakti, say when we pray to God. I was with, uh, I was in Australia and one person asked this question. He said, I'm very afraid to pray to God. Oh, really? He says, okay, why is that? He says, I have faith in God now, but if I pray to him and he doesn't answer my prayers, then I will lose my faith. So better I will not pray to him only. That's an interesting uh, way of thinking. <laughs> now, the problem with this way of thinking is that we have a very short-sighted understanding of prayer. Prayer is not just meant to get God to do the things that we can't do. Prayer is also meant to connect us with God so that we don't get overwhelmed by problems. See, the nature of problems is, see, if I am facing a problem, and if I think about the problem, if I think about the problem, keep thinking about the problem, it starts becoming bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And that it overwhelms us. Life determines our problems, but we determine their size. So when we pray to God, we, the point is not, oh God, remove this problem. Okay, sometimes God can do that. But the more important thing is, when we pray to God, we just, we don't stop. We just don't, we stop just obsessing over the problem. And this problem may be big, but God is bigger still. This thing may have gone wrong, but still God is in charge. And God can bring good even out of the bad. So we, the purpose of prayer is not to tell God how big our problems are. Oh God, please solve this problem. The purpose of prayer is to tell ourselves how big God is. So when we remember how big God is, and not just remember in the intellectual sense, but remember in an experiential sense. Say when we participate in some kirtan, we do some puja, we come in the presence of the Lord, we come to satsang, we experience some, vibes, some special vibes, some sacred vibes, they calm us down. So yes, this thing has gone wrong, and we'll see how to fix it. But there are many things that have gone wrong in my life in the past also. And I have survived through all of them. And it's not that each time it was my skill alone that led to this, uh, things working out right. Yeah, things work out eventually. So when we pray to God, it's primarily to raise our consciousness, to expand our consciousness, to become aware of God's presence, God's controllership, God's benevolence. And thus, the problem start, the stops overwhelming us. And when the problem stops overwhelming us, then we can do our part more responsibly. We can do our part more effectively. So um, what, am I, what is the topic we are discussing now? How bhakti affects our work. So in this what I am talking about is, I talked about duty, duration, destiny leading to the desired result. So what we are talking now is how the practice of bhakti, not that it will necessarily produce the result, but that it will help us to do our duty better. 
because if we are practicing bhakti if we are praying to god not as a substitute for our work but praying so that we have the strength to do our work shri prabhupad he would say that the best prayer we can offer to god is oh god please give me the strength to serve you please give me the strength to do my part to be responsible to do my duty that means our part in the whole equation for producing the result prayer can help prayer and bhakti can help us to do our part better spiritual our spirituality can increase our ability to tap our ability how we might have some ability but if we don't have maturity if you are very unstable if your mind is very restless then we can't use our own ability properly but if you are calm then we can use our ability better so our spirituality enables us to it increases our ability to tap our ability and in for this it's important to understand that the work that we do is not dependent only on the time that we spend on it the some tasks are time bound you know okay i have to fold this 10 clothes it's going to take me 15 minutes that's like item wise but many of the issues that we face in our life are much more complex and if say we are facing some problem some relationship problem some complex professional situation um then uh, if we consider a graph of problem solving ability with time then this graph we can say it goes up straight so if i don't think about the problem itself then i have no ability to solve the problem i apply myself and i get more and more clarity okay if i do this this will happen if i do this this will happen yeah therefore i should do this so we get more and more clarity so we have problems and we need to think about them however when this when we are sol- trying to solve our problems this graph which goes up that means the more we think the more clarity we get about what to do this is not a infinitely extending line beyond a particular point it flattens out it flattens out off oh. the more we think we don't get any clarity and after some time it starts going down what happens the more we think the more confused we get like some people say you know, i was i was confused earlier now i am not so sure <laughs> <laughs> that means now i am earlier i was confused now i am not even sure whether i was confused <laughs> <laughs> so the mind overthinking can make us confused about whether whether, whether we are confused <laughs> <laughs> How many of you have got into overthinking? Did I? Yeah. Overthinking, isn't it? Thank you. Now it's like, see, our mind is like a fan. Now the fan moves round and round and round. At least the fan cools us down. But when our mind moves round and round and round, it heats us up. <laughs> <laughs> so, for us. Uh, the ability to solve the problems doesn't increase simply by how much time we spend on it so sometimes some people may say oh you are not working you are simply praying you are simply doing your bhakti well if we don't work at all and simply do our bhakti then that is being irresponsible but to think that because somebody is doing bhakti that means you are not doing your work it's not like that because as i said the ability to do the work doesn't depend only on the amount of time we spend I have, I have traveled across the world many times. I have met devotees who are phenomenally successful, even in their professional careers. And many of them have said to me that after we started practicing bhakti, we are amazed about how much we are able to do during our day. Because what happens? There's a lot of time that is eaten up by our mind. Uh, how many of you worry? Oh. Everybody worries. Now, does anyone have a daily worry time? <laughs> really? 
<laughs> in the morning getting this ready okay <laughs> but does worry stop after that time little bit yeah i know so what happens with worry is you, now of course you are getting your kids ready but it is not that you are just sitting and worrying hmm? you are doing work also but there is anxiety about whether this will get done or not but what happens sometimes our worry is so that about is about things which we can practically deal with at that time and we need to get it done so not all worry is necessarily bad of course the word worry has a negative connotation but we could also use the word intensity focus sometimes the little concern about whether the intended result will come or not can increase our focus and help us to do things well but the destructive kind of worry is about things which we can't do much about say for example we are working and maybe the economy is going down we feel what if i lose my job well you can't do anything about the economy going down right now isn't it what you can do is at least do your job well but when we start worrying about th- in every situation in our life some things in our are in our control some things are not in our control so when some things are largely out of our control and when we worry about them then basically we go out of control we become overwhelmed by that so with respect to our capacity to do our work better if our mind is restless then our mind eats so much of our energy and it's not just by worry there are so many ways like that uh, sometimes the mind makes small things very big say we come for a meeting and then maybe we come for a program if you're a student you're going you're, if you're tra- doing some training you go for a class and maybe there is someone whom you know and you greet them and they snub you and then the next one hour the mind is filled with revenge fantasies next time in public instead of in front of everyone i'm going to snub this person now in your daily schedule for that one hour you were in the class but actually you were not in the class so that one hour was taken by your mind by your by the ways thoughts of the mind so the point i'm making over here is that uh, our time is not just taken by our work our mind is also our time is also taken by our mind the mind's waste thoughts the mind's worry thoughts they take so much of our time but that time we hardly ever put into our schedule so our bhakti won't take our work time it will take away our waste time the time we waste on the waste thoughts of our mind so actually speaking if we practice bhakti diligently we will be able to do our duty better so bhakti is not a substitute for doing our duty bhakti is something which will give us the strength to do our part in life better and that's not the only thing how will bhakti affect the remaining two things the destiny and the duration this is a complex subject but with respect to duration for us when some things are beyond our control say we have done our part and now we are waiting for the result then how, how do we wait how do we go through that waiting period we are constantly thinking when will this happen when will, will this happen or not when will this happen then we will just uh, <coughs> not be able to do anything constructive during that period but that duration when we have done our part and the result is yet to manifest if we understand now i have done my part now the rest is in god's hands then we will be able to be peaceful do your best and leave the rest to god <coughs> our spiritual knowledge helps us not only control better the things that are in our control but also manage better when things are out of our control so whatever time duration we have to face we have to deal with by waiting what our spirituality does it during that waiting period also it gives us something constructive to do our connection with krishna as so chanting his holy names reading scripture hearing about him hearing some spiritual wisdom this is something which we can do all the time and we can engage ourselves constructively so during this period when the work is done and the results have not yet come that time and it's just wasting it or is going out, letting it go in worry we can use it constructively 
and then with respect to destiny in the mahabharat there's a beautiful story on the 14th day actually on the 10th day bhishma who was the first commander fell and after that everybody thought that karna will become the next commander because karna was a close friend of duryodhan and duryodhan also went to karna and says please take up the mantle of commandership and karna said no he said drona is still on the war field and drona is your guru make him the commander now drona was expecting that karna will become the commander and he didn't like the idea that he will have to obey karna because drona was much more senior but when drona was made the commander he was he was very pleased he said oh you pleased me with this honor o duryodhan i would like to give you some benefit benediction what would you like now drona duryodhan was just waiting for this opportunity um, i presume all of you know the mahabharat basically basic outline so if, if not i'll just give a background then we can move forward <coughs> but so if you know then then duryodhan said now i want you to arrest yudhishthir and bring him alive before me so drona's wife eyes opened wide he says oh he says, yudhishthir is so virtuous one of the names of yudhishthir ajat shatru he was so kind that his enemy would not be born nobody would want to be the enemy of such a person it was like that he says yudhishthir such a ajat shatru that you don't want you don't want to have to kill him you want him to be brought alive brought alive so duryodhan said that actually if we kill if we kill duryodhan yudhishthir bhima and arjuna will go mad in anger and they will destroy my entire army so after 10 days of fighting and the way they have brought down bhishma i have concluded that the pandavas can't be defeated now when drona heard this he said why do you want me to become the commander why do you want to <laughs> why do you want to continue the fight <laughs> that thought came in his mind but then duryodhan said therefore i have a plan He says, "If you arrest Yudhishthir and bring me, bring him alive before me, I will challenge him to another gambling match, and then I will have him defeated and send him to forest for another thirteen years. And during that time, I will increase my army. So just see how far the mind plans, <laughs> and what a perverted way he plans. So when Drona heard this, he shook his head. This guy is never going to learn." Hmm. But anyway, he had given his word. So then Drona said that uh, there is no warrior on their side who can stop me except for Arjuna. Although Arjuna is my student, he was my most diligent student. So he has learned everything that I taught him. And on top of that, he has performed austerities and got celestial weapons. And not only that, he is young, whereas I am aging now. So if Arjuna comes in the way, I will not be able to. capture you dishtir <coughs> so duryodhan said don't worry he says i'll i'll distract arjuna and they got a king susharma of the trigartas he said i will challenge arjuna every day and i will take him away <coughs> and that's what happened on the first day of duryodhan's commandership that is the 15th 11th day 10th day 11th day on the 11th day he just fought fiercely and he attacked yudhishthir and yudhishthir's charioteer was killed his horse was horses were killed his chariot wheels were destroyed yudhishthir's armor was destroyed and yudhishthir was about to be captured but somehow at the last moment arjuna got the news and arjuna intervened and arjuna saved the day on the 12th day duryo duryo dhritra So, Dronacharya launched a similar severe attack, and this day again he came close to arresting Yudhishthir, and again Arjuna came and stopped. And on the second, on this twelfth day, Duryodhan had put a lot of his forces in trying to stop Arjuna, but Arjuna had destroyed all of them, and he had frustrated 
Duryodhana in his attempt to capture Yudhishthira also. So Duryodhana got very angry. And he went to Drona and he said, Oh Acharya, you had promised, you had promised to arrest Yudhishthira. And I have, whatever you requested, I provided to the best of my ability. I have tried to satisfy you. But why is it that you are not honoring your word? Is it that you are partial to the Pandavas? If that is the case and if you cannot fight wholeheartedly against them, then please step down as the commander. Let Karana become the commander and he has promised me that he will destroy the Pandava army in one day. When Drona heard this, he became infuriated. He said, O oh Prince, can you not see that my body is filled with wounds of arrows born for your sake. I have exerted myself fully. What more do you think Karna can do for you? I promised you that I will arrest you, Dishtir. And I tried my best. But only endeavor is in our hands. The result is determined by destiny. And the Lord of Destiny sits on the chariot of Arjuna. As long as the Lord of Destiny sits on the chariot of Arjuna, your success is impossible. So the point he is making here is that Krishna is the Lord of Destiny. Now, what does it mean, the Lord of Destiny? See, we are the makers of our destiny, but we are not the masters of our destiny. Makers means what? What is destiny? Destiny is not some mysterious force which somehow does something, gives something good to someone and something bad to someone. Destiny is basically the sum total of our past karma. We all have done some good things and some bad things. And those good and bad things, they produce good and bad results, good and bad situations in our life at different times. So it's like, suppose we are driving, we are going, say, we are driving from one place to another. And so our driving skill is our ability. But the kind of weather we get, the kind of traffic that we get, that's not in our control. So the, situ so the situations that we get in our life are determined by destiny. And that's how the efforts, whether they produce the results or not, that is affected. So we make our destiny in the sense that the kind of actions that we have done in the past, they have shaped our present destiny. And the kind of actions that we do now will shape our future destiny. So we are the makers of our destiny, but we are not the masters of our destiny. Masters means that which good action will produce which good result when. And which bad action will produce which bad result when? That we don't control. That is controlled by Krishna. <coughs> because Krishna is the Lord of Destiny. Now, if we please Him by our Bhakti, then He can orchestrate destiny in such a way that we can get the results faster. Krishna is the Lord of Destiny. He can reshape destiny. And thus, our Bhakti can help us to produce, to make our life better. When we practice bhakti, it is not that we are running away from life to God. Rather, we are turning towards God as a resource so that we can make our life richer, we can make our life better. And ultimately, by God's grace, we may have to go through difficulties. Sometimes we will get success, sometimes we will not get success. But if we are sheltered in our bhakti, then even if failure comes, we won't become too disheartened by it. Because we know God is with us. We will understand that, I'll conclude with this point, and then we can have some <coughs> questions. That we will understand that in our life journey, the failure and success, 
they are not the ultimate purpose we are souls and we are meant to connect when we are meant to connect with krishna and in that loving connection with him there is a supreme peace there is a supreme joy so that is like an ultimate treasure or say that is like uh, five billion pounds and whatever pleasures and pains that we get in life the pleasures of life are like a five pound gain the pains of life are like a five pound loss now every pound matters but in perspective as compared to five billion pounds five pounds don't matter so na praharishet priyam prapya nodvijet prapya cha priyam sthira buddhir asam mudho brahma vid brahma nisthitah when we become brahma vid when we become spiritually knowledgeable brahma nisthitah when we become spiritually situated personally connected with krishna then that connection gives us such sublime satisfaction sublime strength that when good things happen we don't become elated by that na praharishet priyam prapya when bad things happen we don't become dejected by that we stay steady and thus we can steadily march ahead in our life and even if life hurts us we'll find that if we practice bhakti steadily greater than the world's power to hurt is god's power to heal and we will recover faster from life's hurts and move forward creating a better life a richer life a more meaningful and fulfilling life for ourselves as well as our loved ones so i'll summarize i spoke on the topic of how our bhakti improves our life and i started by some people think that bhakti is like running away from life we, we don't instead of doing our work we just chant or pray but i talked about how it's not like that i talked about three parts first is how our work produces the result does anyone remember the four d's what is it duty destiny, destiny duration that produces the desired result yes so i give examples of um, farming of um, of having a child of sports players so our performance matters but even sports players have superstitions because they are somehow trying to appease the unknown which also they know which shapes the results so um, our work is one cause in the set of events that produces the results our work is not the sole cause of the results then i talk about what is bhakti it is not just some ritual it is not just some sentimentality bhakti is conscious continuous cultivation of the heart cultivation of the heart so that by connecting with god we become godly that means the weaknesses within us the negativities the weaknesses weaken and the virtues the strengths strengthen and when we practice bhakti in this way the third part is the elaborate part about how bhakti shapes our work and its results so i talked there about when we do our work uh, the practice of bhakti is not meant to replace our work not do is one's work is not detachment it is irresponsibility detachment is after we do the work we let go of the results the responsibility is we let go we refuse to do the work itself but our what it bhakti does is it increase our spirituality increases our ability to tap our ability our capacity to do our work is not determined simply by how many hours we spend on it i talked about how our mind can take up so much of our time the graph of problem solve uh, problem solving ability versus time is linear but only up to a particular point beyond that it flattens and then beyond that it goes south so our mind can make us confused and then it can make us confused about whether we are confused also so the bhakti doesn't take away our work time it takes away the our waste time the time that is wasted on the trivial or uh, counterproductive thoughts of the mind and as we can do our work better if we practice bhakti diligently and then the duration between the work and the result that duration we can tolerate better we can live through better if we are not obsessed 
with the result and bhakti gives us many activities to do with which we can we can fill our mind and fill our heart and we can also have that faith that now the results are in god's hand so there's no need for so much insecurity and then i talked about destiny I told about how the story of drona and duryodhana that we are the makers of our destiny but krishna is the master of our destiny so makers means our action destiny is simply the sum total of the good and bad actions that we have done which are going to produce good and bad results <coughs> that is by destiny now <laughs> okay so now i can uh, what bhakti does is that because krishna is the lord of destiny so he can also reshape destiny so that we can get the good we can get good results or we can avoid the bad results and thus by the practice of bhakti all three elements the duty duration and destiny can be reshaped positively so that we can move towards the desired result and thus prayer is not so much about asking god to change the results but asking god to change us so that we can better work to produce the results thank you very much hare krishna hare krishna so any questions if you really observe the class you will get a lot of questions <laughs> uh, two interrelated uh, questions for you to the first question is um, how to make the balance between work and bhakti and work not the work we do in office but the duties we are supposed to do at home and that leads to the second question that uh, for example for with the children we would like to bring children to krishna consciousness but they want us to go out play cricket or do the drawing i have both son and daughter and they won't let us do the bhakti and uh, we obviously we would like to be role models but they don't let us become the role model either obviously we are not perfect okay so the question is how do we balance between work and bhakti say for example if our children want us to play and we want to practice bhakti see we don't have to reduce bhakti only to directly devotional activities bhakti is inclusive it includes all walks of our life so yes bhakti has an exclusive aspect in the sense that we need to provide exclusive time to connect with krishna so that means that we should we need some time for chanting for pray uh, for satsang for seva what those are the ways by which you directly connect with krishna but along with that there is also an inclusive understanding of bhakti that you know our children are not just uh, are not distractions from bhakti they are not distractions of krishna they are also parts of krishna they have been entrusted to us by krishna and developing a healthy relationship with them is also our service to krishna if we see it that way that means that whatever it takes that is to develop that relationship it is broadly included so we want to help our children to also practice bhakti but they are young right they are they are small and they also need to relate with their parents with their friends in a normal way the children play and we play with them now does that mean that even if even if we are not devotees even if we were non devotees and we were responsible parents that doesn't mean that we would be constantly playing with them we also have even the most responsible parents they don't have the responsibility of their children they have they have to work then they may have some hobbies they may do that so it's it's not that there are times when it might appear as if bhakti is taking the time away from maybe what we could spend with our children or what we could do other activities but that is often a trick of the mind because it's not that necessary that if we were not practicing bhakti we would necessarily be spending that time here only we all have our personal life and we all have a personal interest so even if from a analytical point of view you consider that okay this bhakti is my personal interest but along with that i have my remaining life 
so the inclusive understanding of bhakti is that i bring krishna as is appropriate into all walks of my life so how do we do that with children we our children should feel that by our practice of bhakti we have become better parents better parents means that say and it does happen if we are short tempered then uh, if we practice bhakti our anger goes down and then we may not yell so much at our children we might be more patient more understanding and they will see the difference if we think of bhakti only as a certain set of practices then we may think oh i want to practice this but my children are not letting me do that yes we we want to do some practices but bhakti is not only those practices in the early days of our movement many of the devotees would constantly go out for book distribution so there were some devotee ladies with young very small children and some of the community leaders temple leaders told them that you just entrust that all all your children to one caretaker and all of you go and distribute books when shri prabhupad came to know about the when shri prabhupad came to know about that he wrote a letter he says i am surprised that you are leaving your children with some other woman and going out to distribute books he says for you for you it is primarily to mother but it applies to parents in general he says for you uh, taking care of your child is as important as worshiping your deity he says that these are not ordinary souls they are vaikuntha children they are parts of krishna who been entrusted in your care now of course he thinks it is an extreme somebody can say i i i want to take care of my children and so i have no time to practice bhakti but if we start thinking like that then we will just get caught in entirely material consciousness and then our taking care of children will not also be bhakti so it's a balance and one characteristic of balance is that it is never static it is dynamic balance doesn't mean like a rigid formula okay 9 to 10 i'll do this 10 to 11 i'll do this 11 to 12 i'll do this life is not that predictable we do need some structure but uh, balance is more in a sense of direction rather than specific control that means say if you are riding a cycle riding a cycle then you want to go ahead but if you come re- come to the right the road is turning right then the balance state is a tilted state but then if after you turn right if you still say tilted then you just go in a circle then the balance state is come back vertical then you have to turn left the balance state is left then again vertical so like that for us our purpose is to move toward krishna and sometimes we say now janmashtami is coming up and you have a lot of services then we might spend a little more time in devotional activities but if say our children have vacations are they at home they want us to go somewhere then okay you spend time over there at that time we may to or if a child is sick or child has got exams and then we they need us to help us study then you tilt the time on that way so there is a overall direction is fixed but we balance is dynamic and if we have this inclusive understanding of bhakti as well as the exclusive understanding then we will be able to balance between directly practicing bhakti activities as well as reenvisioning all our responsibilities as bhakti also okay thank you hare krishna any other questions are you sure of it uh slightly extending this uh, question towards uh, striking a balance between uh, bhakti and work uh, a very practical scenario is where you know your profession often needs upgrading yourself all the time uh, so then you do your eight uh, daily eight hours of work you come back home and uh, you tend to think why oh, i need to upgrade myself i need to spend extra couple of hours um so is is the thought process right uh, that you know this exercise is basically um uh, uh, is basically by following this exercise i'm trying to influence the future as you said you should never try to influence the future so is this thought process right that by doing by putting the, those additional hours i'm actually trying to influence my future let me not worry about it let me do my eight hours of work come back home switch off go back to the uh, bhakti mode or uh, sp- uh, give time to my family and let's not worry about it when the time comes krishna is going to help me to scale myself up and uh, sink sink myself to the market 
is that thought process right? Oh. Uh, when did I exactly say that we shouldn't influence our future? I mean, when did I, what did I, what what point gave that impression? I'm just trying to understand that. Uh, no, no, I'm I'm trying to relate. No, but you said you said that I said that I said we should not influence our future. So uh, what point of mine gave that impression uh, to you? Well, I'm trying to correlate this to the fact where uh, where we uh, please come forward. I'm right. I'm trying to correlate to the fact where we discussed that we can only do our work. We cannot influence what is going to be our uh, uh, our situation uh, in a few months or okay. two years down the line. Okay, I got the point. Yes, okay. So if we are in a competitive field where we need to upgrade ourselves, then apart from our job. Then we come home and spend time and honing our skills. Maybe eight hours work, two hours for the thing. Uh, should we do that because that's what the market requires, mm. or should we just depend on Krishna and say that Krishna will provide us uh, whatever, and we just use our remaining time for practicing bhakti and doing our family responsibilities? It's not necessarily this or that. You know, in the in the Mahabharat, Narad Muni tells Yudhishthir that, that in householder life there are three aspects, there is Dharma, Artha and Kama. So Dharma you can broadly say as your Bhakti, Artha is our job, Kama is not just desire, Kama is basically like our family, if you consider. So he says there don't pursue Dharma at the expense of Artha and Kama. Don't do dharma so much that you neglect artha and kama. Don't pursue artha at the expense of dharma and kama. And don't pursue kama at the expense of dharma and artha. Balance all of these. So pursuing artha at the expense of dharma and kama could be called as workaholism. People who are workaholics, not only they have no time, they don't have any time for spiritual life, they don't even have time for their family. Just obsessed with work. And somehow, it's also like an addiction. But it's workaholism is a prestigious addiction. It's like somebody says, I have not taken a leave for the last 10 years. Wow, you're so hard working. Well, yeah, it's not that we want to uh, be lose at our work. But sometimes there's a glamour associated with being obsessive with work. It's, if somebody is alcoholic, you know, there is no glamour in that. Somebody is a device addict, there is no glamour in that. But So we have to be careful. That We all have a tendency toward that. Especially in today's world, where often in the workplace, what happens? There are quantifiable results. Now, if I put in this much work, I earn this much money. If I put in this much more work, I can earn this much more money. Oh, but maybe at home, maybe in our spiritual life, uh, the results are not so quantifiable. So we often live in a deadline driven mode. Most of us, you know, when a project, the deadline comes, that's when we start working and get things done. Now it's good, at least with the deadline we are doing work. But then what happens? There are many things which are important which don't come with a deadline. But they also uh, say, for example, there's a relationship, relationship between husband and wife, relationship between parents and children. There's no deadline that by this time you have to work, develop this relationship. But, you know, but that relationship will be dead if it goes beyond the line. Nobody knows where that line is. Not that nobody knows, but we can't predict in a finite quantity that. So the thing is, these things are also important because we live in a world which is very passionate, in the mode of passion, Rajoguna. So the quantifiable activities are those which we gravitate towards the most because we get a quantifiable result by that. And those are not quantifiable, we push them in the background. So this is so uh, this is the background for the answer the, that we shouldn't think of our success only in terms of quantifiables. So if we are in a particular profession where it's a lot of, where we need to upgrade ourselves constantly, then we have to think whether, okay, if this is a phase, maybe a few months in a year, or maybe a few months in a few years, where I have to work very, very hard, I have to neglect other things, that's okay. But if that is what, 
is required throughout my life then is this really worth it of course if you want to change your profession something it's a major decision and this is not only factor but we have to eventually think whether the amount of time that something is taking is worth it hmm? it's not that if a profession demands a particular level of work and if i don't do that and i say oh i'll depend on krishna now that's not right arjuna when he was chose to be an archer he practiced archery day and night that's why one of his names is gudakesh all day he would learn and all night he would be practicing so he did not they go oh, i will not practice archery but krishna will make sure my arrows hit the target it's not like that so if we choose to be in a particular field we cannot expect krishna to change the rules of the game just for us because we are devotees mm -hmm. yes things will happen by the rules of the game of course krishna by his mercy may help us to perform better krishna can you know give us some lucky breaks things can happen like that but to make that as a expectation that krishna change the rules of our game just because rules of the game because we are devotees that is not a proper understanding of bhakti so we have to seriously think whether this is worth it and sometimes we might decide yes it is worth it right now i have got this financial obligation i've got this so it's worth it but if it's something which is constantly needed then we may have to decide okay i'll do this for the next 5 years or whatever and then i will i will change course i'll do something else and uh, uh, if in phases it is required it's okay but if it's constantly required an excessive amount of uh, obsession with our work then that is unhealthy not only spiritually unhealthy it's also socially unhealthy unhealthy for our relationships also mm. and sometimes we may find that the people we are we may feel i am doing this for my family but you know we have to see what our family values we may think that you know i will get the most expensive cricket bat and the cricket ball for my child and we get that but the our son say i don't want a expensive bat i just want you to play with me so they may value our time more than the gifts that we are, things we are giving them so it's it has to be a, a properly discussed decision which we make properly deliberated and discussed but bhakti is not about uh, uh, bhakti is bhakti is not about expecting krishna to change the rules of the game just because we are devotees okay thank you thank you, thank you. yeah the question on bhakti so how do we know that we are doing bhakti right what do you mean by that uh you saying bhakti is a way of connecting with the god so how do we know that we it, okay what we are doing yeah. or can we do something differently or can we do something better or okay how do we know whether we are doing bhakti right broadly there is a internal symptom of the practice of bhakti or the internal result and there is external result bhakti pareshanu bhava viraktir anyatracha bhakti is the process that gives us para isha anubhav experience of god isha who is para who is transcendental he cannot be experienced you just come in front of the altar and look at the, the eyes it's not that you will experience god but if there is devotion there is prayerfulness and then we offer some prayers we sing some recite some verses then we experience so that is para isha nubha that comes by bhakti so the inner experience of god the inner experience of peace of <coughs> of clarity of strength of enlightenment all that is bhakti and the outer result or the outer uh, uh, characteristic of that you could say is viraktir anyatrach that means we don't become so dependent on outer experiences means outer pleasures don't allure us so much and outer troubles don't agitate us so much we become more steady more equipoised so this is so another way of understanding is that we become more attached to krishna and more detached from the world detached doesn't mean irresponsible detached means detachment is more lack of dependency it is not lack of care hmm? so so this way if these two things are happening then it means that we are practicing bhakti properly 
and if this is not happening then we might need to uh, think what can i do better is answer your question yeah. thank you any other questions yes um in terms of um and trade more and so forth um i run a global business what business i run a global business okay and that global business requires my time which is anything between 10 to 14 hours a day um and within that i don't find that time to actually do anything else apart from focus hmm with major clients and so forth and I just can't find time to do anything else hmm. at all. How could I change that? Okay. Yeah. So if say if you're practicing a global business that takes 10 to 14 hours and just can't do any change in it, what can you do to say practice bhakti or grow spiritually? Uh, there are two aspects to this. First is that we rise toward Krishna. The second is Krishna descends toward us, towards us. That means that we can begin where we are with some small way in which we can add God into our life. It might be you may decide that, okay, every day I will do some mantra meditation for a few minutes. Or every day I will read some spiritual text for a few minutes. Or maybe I'll hear a spiritual talk. You start with what you can do in your situation. Uh, so in the 12th chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna talks about, uh, you could say, a descending ladder of accessibility. He says, first he says in 12.8, constantly think of me. Always think of me. Then he says, if you can't do that, practice to think about me. This chant my holy names, do sadhana bhakti, so that you can think of me. Then he says, if you can't do that, then work for me, do some seva. Hmm? If you can't do that, then he says, work for some cause bigger than yourself. At least get out of yourself. So bhakti is a journey, you could say, from selfishness or self-centeredness to divine selflessness. So divine, the summit of divine selflessness is the self is completely absorbed in God. But if you can't come to that, then at least come out of yourself. So if you are doing a work, then we could give the fruits of our work to Krishna. That is, basically the idea is we want to give God a place in our heart. That's the essence of bhakti. But you know, sometimes our heart is filled with other things. Say if we are... It's in the world when we live, we all need money. So thoughts of money often dominate our heart. <coughs> now, if we can't give Krishna our heart, we can give Krishna what is in our heart. <laughs> so, <laughs> so what is in our heart? Money is in our heart. So when we give charity, what happens? We give Krishna something that is in our heart. And that's how we give Krishna a place in our heart. That's why the important thing in charity is not the quantity but the regularity because what happens it's a more a matter of creating a disposition of the heart and okay what i'm earning ultimately it is meant for god so one time you give a big quantity that's great but what happens by that it's often more our ego is satisfied say i am so generous i give such a huge charity but if we do it regularly even if it's whatever quantity we get then that creates an impression in the heart so there are various ways in which you can connect at whatever level we are at. And gradually, if we connect diligently at our level, uh, then Krishna may guide us how we can connect at a higher level. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, you had a question? Yeah. How does devotee association help us um, this path of bhakti? How does devotee association help us in the path of bhakti? We are social creatures and we all need whatever we all need either people who accept what we are doing or we change ourselves to accept to become acceptable to those people. We are by nature social creatures. So that means if I am living with people, 
either I start doing what will be acceptable to them so that they will accept me or if I want to do something then I have to find people who accept what I am doing so that I am acceptable in their circle. And acceptance is just the beginning. We want to be accepted, we want to be valued, we want to be respected, we want to belong. So, if we want to practice bhakti, it's vital that we have a devotional social circle. Because our devotional activities will not be appreciated or valued by people who are not devotees. They may value other things. And then we will always feel out of place when we are practicing bhakti. So of course, in the material world, not, a very, not, not many people may practice spiritual life right now. But whatever people are practicing, if we have that social circle, then that also f our bhakti practice doesn't come at the cost of depriving us of our social needs. If we don't have devotee association, if we don't come in devotee association, then our bhakti practice starts making us lonely. Because we can't connect with the other people around us. And then we start feeling, you know, should I do this? But then, if we don't do it, then we get lost in materialism. Our life has no higher purpose or value. So if we come in devotee association, then our social need is taken care of. In a way that is harmonious with our spiritual purpose. We have a spiritual purpose to grow spiritually. Then we, but we also have other needs. We have social needs. So at the basic level, devotee association ensures that our social needs are fulfilled harmoniously with our spiritual purpose. At a higher level, devotee association also stimulates and energizes our spiritual journey. Spiritual journey means that we all are trying to develop love for Krishna. So, how do we develop love for Krishna? It is by associating with those who have love for Krishna. Bhakti, Sanjayate, Bhakti. Say for example, now, this, this we have to understand that our desires are not just linear. They are also triangular. What do I mean by linear and triangular? Linear means, say, suppose after this program there is prasad. No, suppose prasad is there. <laughs> but suppose maybe some, some delicious item is there. Maybe suppose some delicious dessert is there. Now, if you see that dessert, just by seeing it, we might get the desire to eat it. That's a linear desire. So many of many desires are linear. We see the object and we get the desire. But many desires are not linear but triangular. That's why I say, for example, uh, whenever say a company, a cell phone company launches a new cell phone, then they will get celebrity endorsements. Maybe some sports star, some movie star. I, I use this phone. Oh. So what happens? We see that person using that phone and that's how we get that desire. Oh, he's using it, I want to use it. And I had gone long ago to Australia, uh, first time, maybe ten, several years ago. So I was invited to a, a devotee's house for prasad. And then he said, well, for, for dessert, we have baklava. Okay, how many of you know what is a baklava? Okay, most of you. I had never heard of a baklava. I said, what is baklava? It's a sweet. Now, mm, the name is not very sweet, isn't it? <laughs> Baklava. <laughs> so I said, I had never heard of it. I said, maybe later. Hmm? Maybe later. And then there's another fr uh, friend with me who had also gone on food. He said, yeah, give me. And then he took it and he was eating it. And he was savoring and relishing it. And I looked at him and I said, give me one also. <laughs> <laughs> So what happened? Just hearing or seeing the baklava, there was no linear desire. But seeing somebody else eat the baklava, there's a triangular desire. <laughs> so similarly, for us in the practice of bhakti, sometimes we may see Bhagavad Gita and you know, it's, it's not often that we will, oh, I want to know what is Bhagavad Gita. But if we associate with somebody who is studying the Bhagavad Gita, who is relishing the Bhagavad Gita, who is getting fresh insights and energy by studying the Gita. What is there in the Gita? I want to study it also. So in spiritual life, most of our desires are triangular. 
many of us, if we are from a traditional background, we might have heard of kirtans. I think kirtan is something which is a religious activity done in temples. But if you come and asso associate with devotees who are into kirtan, and we see them, they are closing their eyes, absorbed, clapping, and apparently in another world. You think, hey, what is this kirtan? You know, I also want to experience it. Let me try it out. So, it is largely because spiritual life is about subtler things. So, just seeing the object may not create the desire. But seeing somebody experiencing something that creates the desire within us. So, association of devotees taps the triangularity of desires and uses our and nourishes our spiritual desires. And that's why association is the single most important thing in our spiritual life. If we are associating, then all the other limbs of bhakti will fall in place gradually. Okay. So. Yeah, But the outside environment is very challenging and competitive. Mm. If kids practice this, are they going to be how they integrate this two together? That's my question. How they successful in the outside environment? Yeah. So outside world is competitive. Mm. So if Being kids, a nice person, yeah, is it easy to survive yeah. In the yeah. So if these kids practice bhakti and learn to be a nice person, then they can't fit into the system. Uh, not necessarily. See, we all have certain stereotypes of what bhakti is. Now, Arjuna, was he a nice person? Well, obviously he was not a bad person. But being a nice person didn't mean that he didn't fight a war when he had to. Of course, he tried his best to avoid the war. He tried to resolve the issue by by non-confrontational means. But when the confrontation was required, he did not back away from it. So, bhakti doesn't mean that we become all soft and uh, uh, fuzzy, fuzzy. Bhakti means we can even be tough when we need to be tough. In fact, many, uh, many companies, I, I speak in Silicon Valley, so I've spoken at Intel, at Stanford, at Salesforce, these are all big, big companies and they all encourage their employees to have some spiritual practices. In fact, Salesforce is one of the biggest companies in America uh, and Salesforce has a special meditation hall in their premises. And they have found that if their employees, when they're very stressed, they go and sit in the meditation hall, do some meditation. They come back and they have performance parameters, they perform better. They found since they have incorporated meditation, they, their, from a practical perspective, for them the bottom line is important. The health insurance costs for their employees have gone down. So it's, uh, it's quite well documented that spiritual practices can help us face life's challenges better. So if we have a like, stereotypical understanding now, should as spiritualists we be nice people? Yes, nice in the sense that we don't want to exploit others. We don't want to be corrupt. But nice doesn't mean naive. It doesn't mean that we think, oh, because we are devotees, the whole world is a nice place and if I am nice, everybody will be nice with me. It's not like that. The world is tough. And we have to be tough. Like earlier I said, it, bhakti doesn't mean we expect God to change the rules of the game for us. This is a tough game and we have to fight the tough game. But bhakti can toughen us from within so that we can we can face life's challenges better. Basically, bhakti expands our vision of life so that when we face problems, we understand that life is bigger than these problems. These problems are there, but life is much bigger than this. And that's how we can we can live with those problems, we can tolerate those problems. So we may have to live with pain, but we don't have to live in pain. For somebody who doesn't have a spiritual understanding of life, say if they lose their job, or if somebody does a court case against them, or their relationship falls apart, they feel this is the end, this is what I was living for. And if this has fallen, then what is the point of my life? <coughs> but bhakti gives us a bigger purpose for our life. All these things are important, but there's something even more important. And thus, by expanding our vision of life, 
we can see we can face life's challenges better okay thank you another question Yeah. This might be a bit more personal question, but um, what made you dedicate your life to this bhakti yoga and what keeps you going? Because you've been practicing it for quite some while now, right? Okay. Mm. What made me practice? Okay, there's, there's a lot of things, but I'll answer briefly in light of the second question also about what <coughs> keeps me going. Basically, since my childhood, I had a desire to contribute to society. And as I grew up, because I was physically handicapped, so my, I had polio, so my parents told me, especially my mother told me, that, you know, what God has taken away physically, He has given you intellectually. So, uh, I was very much into studies. And I did well in studies. And I developed a lot of faith in the power of education in creating a better life. So when I was studying my engineering, I joined a social welfare organization and there I started going to underprivileged children where they were staying and offering them free, free classes. So while I was doing that, I found that many of these children came from dysfunctional families, so alcoholism was rampant. And then we decided, our organization, organization decided, I, I based one of my inputs also that we should work to help them become free from alcoholism and we brought some campaigners and we were reasonably successful in that so but then one time it turned out that there's a local municipality elections and not only the fathers but even their kids they all, the local local politician had brought like three truckloads of liquor to woo people to vote for him. And the fathers and their kids, everybody had drunk. Hmm. So at that time I started thinking that, you know, education can open doors for people. But something inside them stops them from walking through. Something inside us works against us. So... That's the time I started reading books to understand ourselves, book, philosophical books. And then I came to the Bhagavad Gita. And then, through the Bhagavad Gita, I understood how within us, and there are dark forces, there's lust, anger, greed, envy, pride, illusion. All of these, they affect us negatively. And they undermine our potential. So then I started practicing bhakti myself. I started sharing it with others. One of my close friends in college was just gliding towards alcoholism. But he started practicing bhakti and he just became free from it. So I found that this was a very powerful way of inner empowerment. Then at that time I was also studying so I had done given my GRE. I had, I had come first in the state of Maharashtra at that time in GRE. So I had a lot of opportunity to come to go to America and <clears throat> grow. In, I also got a job in a multinational software company. But then I felt that I could contribute to society better by sharing spiritual knowledge than by maybe writing software programs or doing something else. So that's how I decided to uh, dedicate my life to sharing spiritual knowledge. And over the years, I've seen uh, many amazing stories of transformation. Not that I caused them, but I become an agent for them. Uh, one of the... Once I had gone to an American university and I was speak, I spoke on the topic of uh, what was it? <clears throat> regulating our mental diet. It was vegetarian society. So just as we regulate our physical diet, we should regulate our mental diet. And after that, one American boy came and he told me that just before this class, I was contemplating suicide. What happened? He said that I was in a relationship with a girl and she broke up with me. And I had invested a lot in that relationship. So I was very depressed. But I was, I was wandering along the campus. I saw a poster for this program. And he said, something within me said, just go for this talk. So he said, when I came here, now I understood that it is not I who want to commit suicide. There is my mind inside me. And my mind is saying, commit suicide, commit suicide. But I don't have to listen to my mind. So I said, this is a life-saving insight you have got. 
and I told him that I connected him with the local Bhakta Yoga Club. I encouraged him to read the Bhagavad Gita. I have an online website called Gita Daily, where I write every day on the Gita. So he connected with that. And then every year, whenever I go twice a year to America, so whenever I go to that university, I would meet and talk with him. A few years later, he came to me again and he said, you know, I was in a similar situation. Again, I was in a very, very relationship in which I deeply invested. And suddenly that girl broke up with me. And she just sent it a message. And she said that, I don't want to talk with you. I'm going to block you. Don't even contact me. So he says, I was completely dazed. He says, I went into my room. I closed all the doors. I put down the curtains. And then at that time, he was thinking, thinking about ending his life but somehow over the years in becoming he had started getting attracted he was into music and he had started getting attracted to spiritual music so he had a violin and whenever kirtans would be there he would bring the violin and play kirtan over there <coughs> so suddenly something within him said pick up that violin so instead of trying to end his life he picked up pick up that violin and he started singing he started singing Hare Krishna all alone in the darkness in his room and he said I just poured out my heart and sang and sang and he said for six hours continuously I was singing and he said that time in the darkness I experienced like a light within my heart I felt the presence of Krishna I felt as if I was bathed in some sublime embrace and he said that which was that which could have been a most depressing experience of my life became one of the most enriching experiences of my life. So, oh, it was, that is of course a dramatic story of transformation. But, you know, sometimes we all can make some difference in some lives. And that's what keeps me going. Okay. Thank you. So, Hare Krishna. We are very grateful to Prabhu to have such a wonderful Early learning, early class today.